Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday, October 4th. Before we begin our worship service, I just have two quick announcements. First, a reminder um, that we are continuing our small group communion services on Tuesday at noon and Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, please uh, consider joining us for one of those services. They're very short um, and it gives you an opportunity to share in the Lord's Supper with other members of the congregation. And then I'm pleased to announce that on Sunday, October 25th, we will be beginning coming again inside for Sunday morning worship. Um, I hope you'll mark your calendars and be with us that Sunday. Um, during this, uh, this time of COVID, we are only going to plan on doing one service at 9.30. So please mark your calendars for, for Sunday, October 25th at 9.30. Um, Pre-registration will be required uh, for that service because we're limited to the number of people that can participate at, um, I think it's 75, maybe it's 65. Um, but anyway, um, you do need to sign up in advance and we will get information out about that uh, in time for you to do it the week before. So those are our announcements. We begin this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in confessing our sin and receiving the words of absolution. Please follow along. Lord, we have heard your words of love, but they continue to fall on deaf ears. Your word of forgiveness is clearly for us, but instead we choose to listen to other lords. We have turned away in our desperate search for our own fulfillment. We have betrayed ourselves by what we think, say, and do. We are empty, Lord. Fill us with your word of love. God's word is clear today. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from the impurities of life. God's word is clear today. Our old self was crucified with Jesus so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. God's word is clear today. While we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. God loved the world and gave a son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. God's word is our word of love. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in praying together the prayer of the day. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is found in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. 
He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel today is found in Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, kids. Welcome to Sunday Worship. I want you guys to think way back for some of you, this might have been only like two years ago. For some of you, maybe five years ago. But way back when you were small enough that you had to sit in a high chair to eat your food. Okay. Maybe you can't think that far back. Maybe you've seen um, toddlers and babies in high chairs. Maybe you have siblings or little cousins or you go to daycare and you've seen this. What do kids sometimes do 
especially kids that are small enough to be in high chairs, what do they sometimes do when you give them food? Have you ever seen a child throw it on the floor? And then your mom or your daycare person gives the baby, the toddler, another piece of food. They squish it around and they throw it on the floor and they keep doing this. And, and they just keep doing it over and over and maybe a little bit gets in their mouth, but most of it just ends up on the floor. Okay, what would happen if the caregiver, the parent or the, the other caregiver stopped giving them food and they just didn't give it to them because they were just tired of them throwing it on the floor? What do you think would happen eventually? Eventually, um, they would get sick, right? They would get malnourished. They wouldn't have any fat in their body anymore and they would get very thin. And when you're malnourished, you get sick very easy. So they would get sick very easy. And that's why we um, don't just stop giving babies food, right? We keep giving it to them even though it ends up on the floor because eventually some of it's gonna make it in their mouth. Um, the parable uh, that we heard today um, is very similar to that story, right? So the workers, they weren't listening to the vineyard owner. They're, they would be asked to do something and they would say no. It would be very reasonable things and they would just, they would say no or they wouldn't do it. But the worker kept giving them second chances, just like we keep giving children second chances, right? And they would say no and they would keep going. And, and I think what that does is it reminds us um, of God never, never um, stopping with us, right? We can be sinful. We can refuse to do things. We can go against God's wishes and God still keeps trying. He still wants us to have chances and chances and God is always going to be there for us. He's always going to be trying to give us food or give us, put us in the right direction, the things that we need to do to be um, happy and healthy Christians. God is never going to give up on us. Um, and with the hope that one day we'll do what's right, we'll do what God is telling us to do, we'll eat the food, we'll work in the vineyard. So I'd like to close in prayer. So close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for never giving up on us and for loving us like a parent loves a child. We love you too. Amen. Please join me in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The gospel today is hard to hear. There's not a lot of good news in it. It, it sounds harsh. It sounds um, angry. And that's because it's taken out of the middle of an argument that Jesus is having with the chief priests and the elders and the leaders of the Jewish people. It's helpful in this case to go back to the beginning of the argument and see what's going on. Jesus is telling this parable as an answer to the question. And the question that was uh, posed to him, and again, in a very adversarial way, was, who gives you the authority to say these things? So this is part of his answer. This is like, you know, this is what gives me the authority. If we look at the, at the, the parable through that lens, it really helps us to sort out what's going on here. So that being said, the center of the parable clearly is Jesus' claim to authority. He's like, I have the authority because I was sent by the Father. 
No, it says in the text that the Son is sent by the Father. That gives him authority. And that gives us some interesting points because, you know, the point here, this is one of the earliest times that Jesus is foretelling his own death as he comes into Jerusalem. You know, people were still thinking at this point that the Messiah was going to come as a powerful, all-conquering king. And this is one of the first times that Jesus is saying, nope, it isn't really going to work like that. It's going to come quite differently. The son is going to come and be killed, be put to death. But there's, there's some other kind of interesting points here too. I think it's, it's somewhat unfair to call this the parable of the wicked tenants because they, they aren't the central focus of it but they do exist. But notice that this is a, this is a, a vineyard. Right? Within the context of the parable, we have a vineyard. And as we saw from the Isaiah reading earlier, the vineyard is clearly the people of Israel. This, there's no question about how this would be understood by people. But in the Isaiah parable, the problem with the vineyard is that the fruit is no good. You know, as God you know, planted grapes, I got wild, sour things. God expected justice and righteousness, and he got injustice and all kinds of problems. Oppression of the poor is something that's mentioned a little further along than our text. It's the fruit of the vineyard that are the problem in the Isaiah text. In the Matthew text, in the Gospel text as we have it, the fruit is not the problem. By all, by all uh, accounts, the fruit is coming up fine. What is being planted is what is expected. The problem is the people who are tending to the vineyard. And they are being selfish. The vineyard is producing and they are saying, we're going to keep this all for ourselves. We're not going to spread it around. We're not going to share it. We're not even going to return it to the person who owns it because this is ours. We're doing the work here. This is really all about us. Looked at in this context, I think we can start to see that this is a situation that comes up for a lot of people. You know? It's very easy for us, for all of us, to look around and say, you know, I've built this. I've put in the work. I've done this. This is mine. I'm going to do what I want to with it. It's very easy to overlook all the blessings that God has given us, the the fact that it belongs to God in the first place, the call to give back to God what is his. And that applies to all kinds of things. It can apply to congregations. It can apply to businesses. It can apply to our personal lives. It's all God's. Like the tenants of the vineyard, we are called to give the first fruits, to return to God what is his due, and he reminds us constantly to share with others. Talking about this simply within the context of the church, it's very easy for any congregation to say, you know, here we have this congregation and we've built it up over years. You know, we have this wonderful program that we've worked so hard to create. We have this endowment fund that we have filled up. We have all of these things. We have this beautiful sanctuary. Here we are, this is ours. And in a congregation, we would never say, we don't want anything to do with God, of course not. But how do we behave? How do we behave? Because the coming of Jesus reminds us that it's never all about us. That vineyard does not exist just to sit there and be a vineyard. That vineyard exists to send out things so that the fruits of the vineyard go forth. It's not enough for us to have wonderful programs that serve the members of our community, although, of course, we want that, right? We want to have Bible studies and fellowship and things that build up the body of Christ. But the whole point of that building up is to go forth and to go out, to take that out into the world, whether it's to our immediate neighbors, to people who are in need, to, people, to the various churches around the world, wherever it is, to let it out, to open the doors, to send it out and let it go forth. That can be hard to do. 
And it's not necessarily from selfishness, although that's often part of the root of it. It can be from fear, you know, if we, if we spend money on this, will we have enough money to do that, you know? And what this parable reminds us is that, you know, no earthly structure or form is permanent. This vineyard that was planted, it was planted by God. He set it up the way he did and it worked for a while, but then it stopped working and he's going to come and tear it down. But he'll start again, he says, and build something new. This church, this congregation, I've seen it happen, you know. God plants it, builds it up, it does a great job, but then stops sending things out, stops, becomes inward turning. And God says, okay, we'll start over here. We'll build a new one. It's a reminder to us not to cling too tightly to those things that are changeable, to those things that are of the earth. Yeah. We don't, a certain form of liturgy, a certain hymn book, a certain program that we've always had at the church, you know, those things can fall away. But what God really expects of us is that we send forth. And so that we have the fruits that we can send forth into his world, God blesses us. He fills us with his grace and his many gifts so that we always have something from God to give to others.
With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation, especially St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially Ray Rohr, Vicki Bosin, John Farmer, Mary Jo Freshwater, Marjorie King, Art and Cleo Nimi, Floyd Redepenning, Merdalis Tweeton, and all those that we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son 